أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أهل الكتاب لا تغلوا في دينكم ولا تقولوا على الله إلا الحق إنما المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله وكلمته وكلمته ألقاها إلى مريم وروح منه فآمنوا بالله ورسله ولا تقولوا ثلاثة إنته قير لكم إنما الله إله واحد سبحانه أن يكون له ولد له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وكفى بالله وكيلا In this ayat 171 of section 23 of Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah. Allah says, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of Allah aught but truth. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle of Allah, and his word which Allah bestowed on Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his apostles. Say not, Trinity, desist. It will be better for you. For Allah is one Allah. Glory be to him, for exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And Allah is enough as a disposer of affairs. The Quranic revelation appeared six centuries after Jesus. And unlike Judaism and Christianity, which do not admit any revelation subsequent to their own, directs all Muslims to believe in the scriptures that preceded it in the same surah section 20 ayat 136 it stresses the important positions of Allah's emissaries such as Noah Abraham Moses the prophets and Jesus in the same surah in section 23 of ayat 163 then in this ayat it mentions the attributes of Jesus Christ, a son of a woman Mary, and therefore a man, giving the same description of parthenogenesis to his biological birth without a biological father as the Gospels, an apostle and a spirit from God, but not Nausbillah, God. For says Quran, God is independent of all needs and has no need of a son to manage his affairs. The word which, is, which occurs in this surah, which is bestowed on Mary, means that he was created from God's word, be kun, and not as in the Gospel of John or whoever wrote it, surrounded by Alexandrian and Gnostic mysticisms, the word logos in Greek, which is surrounded by this mysticism. The Quran follows on from the two revelations that preceded it, but is free from contradictions and various human manipulations, 
and provides a unique quality when examined objectively and in the light of science. That is, it is in complete agreement with modern scientific data. Madam President, Mr. Ahmad Dida, and ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor for me to welcome Mr. Ahmad Dida this evening on behalf of the Daughters of Islam. The question arises, who are the Daughters of Islam? Very briefly, we have two basic aims. Firstly, to forge unity among Muslims, hence our motto, Ittihad Bainul Muslimat. And secondly, our real mission is to acquire knowledge and to help in spreading it in every way possible. It is in connection th with this that we have been holding group discussions and organizing lectures by various scholars. So ladies and gentlemen, in keeping with our mission of acquiring knowledge, we have with us today Mr. Emma Didat, the renowned scholar of comparative religion from South Africa. His debates with Christian scholars are now famous and are viewed all over the world. He uh, operates from Durban, where we, he has set up the Islamic Propagation Center, and uh, he has been awarded with the King Faisal Award in recognition of his services to Islam. So uh, now I request Mr. Brother Ahmed Dida to please address the public. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Qul Ya Ahl Al-Kitab Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum An la na'buda illa Allah Wa la nushrika bihi shay'an Wa la yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah Fa in tawallaw Fakul ushadu bi anna muslimun Sadaq Allah, Sadaq Allah Azim. My dear daughters and my brothers and sons on the top, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon to come and share with you my thoughts on some aspects of Islam. And I was in a quandary, I was in a haze. I didn't know I was thinking, what shall I say, what shall I say, what am I going to speak? And uh, as if God sent, the sister who preceded me here, she read the verse that I read to you just now from the Holy Quran. And that gave me an idea that, look, this is the voice of God. As if Allah Bari Tala is speaking through her, I said, look, speak about this. And I was greatly relieved. You see, it has happened that when the Qari, you know, generally when our functions start, we get a Qari, a good reciter, to start the rest of our, our meetings. And uh, then they call the speaker. It was for Juma prayer in my own city in Durban. The Qari was called pre khutbah talk. The Qari was called, he recited. And then they called me and said, now Mr. Didat will speak. So out of what the Qari was reading from the Quran, I repeated a verse from his recitation. He was reading about on هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ that portion of the ruku he was reading. So I read that verse out of that full recitation. And I'm asking my audience, the sons of Islam, I said, in the past 24 hours, if any of you have heard that verse, please put up your hands. I said, in the past 24 hours, it was actually in the past four minutes, the, everybody had heard. But I'm asking, I want to make it a little harder for them. I said, look, in the past 24 hours, anybody heard these words? I repeat again. And I repeated the verse again. 
Amar Sallaka. And so on. And says, please put up your hands. And one hand went up. One hand went up. In a congregation, Juma congregation, only one hand went up. And I recognized the owner of that hand. That that person knew Arabic. Because he knew Arabic, he knew what the Qari was reading. Therefore he caught and he retained, he remembered what was read in the past 24 hours. The rest of them, Muslims, all born Muslims. Young and old. 99.9% they had never heard the word in the past 24 hours what does that mean it meant that this was just as pure sound music recitation we are listening we say mashallah how beautifully the Qari reads we admire his recitation and we say subhanallah subhanallah we praise the tone, we praise the breath control. How he, the Qari, in, for two minutes, the Qari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, when he starts reciting, two minutes, his breath doesn't break. Carries on and on and on. If you or I were trying to compete with him, our breath would break down half a dozen times before he's finished one breath. So people exclaim, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, everybody shouts. What makes, what it makes one to wonder, what is the Allahu Akbar about? Allah is great, about what? The breath control. The breath control, it's not the meaning, what is the man telling you? As a people, as a whole, the Muslim world, the Allah's kalam is like water on duck's back. You know, you put water on duck's back, even in the rainy season, the duck is dry. You know, it has its feathers, the water just flows off. Similarly, Allah's kalam also flows off from our backs, from our friends, from our minds. It's just the sound, the music, the rhythm. We read the Quran for sawab, 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 blessings, blessings. And wallah, I believe that we will get the sawab. But the real message that is being delivered is being lost. Therefore, we don't catch it because we don't understand the language. We don't understand what is being read. Fortunately, this afternoon, our sister also translated it. She also mentioned that it is from Surah Nisa. She also mentioned that she started from verse 171. So, it is an occasion for us that we can go home and check it up. Check up these things. Not that we distrust the speaker or my sister who was here a little while back. We are not distrusting her. But if we go home and if we can check it up, going over it once more again, she has said something, maybe we caught something, some message of it, and some of it we didn't, because we might not have been familiar with it. But if we go home and check it up in our own good time, then that knowledge become, becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our knowledge. And then when we start sharing with others, it really becomes our property. Like this, ah, it's very good, you listen to a talk, mashallah, you know, it was well delivered, you know, well, the man was well spoken, and he was mesmerizing the people, all that kind of things can happen, but it's, it's a short-term entertainment. You're getting entertained. You do get entertained. We all get entertained. You see, by our learned people, they come along and entertain us. So, it is a very good idea to go home and check up in the Qur'ans at home. I take it that every Muslim has a Qur'an at home. But it's very difficult for the non-Arab, we non-Arabs. I don't know how many Arabs are here. They might be very conversant with the Qur'an, I don't know. But the bulk of our people, very, very difficult. Our sister said Surah Nisa, Surah Nisa. In a Qur'an, a volume of this magnitude, this particular one is the translation, 1920 pages. Where will you find Surah Nisa? In the first instance, to go and check it up. Where? But if you have a translation like this one, this particular one, published on this subcontinent, this part of the world, in Lahore, it was first published in 1935 or there around by 
Sheikh Muhammad Ashraf, Kashmiri Bazar, Lahore. This translation is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. There is another one, Muhammad Ali Kadiani. This is Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Now, in this particular translation, it has advantages which no other translation has. And the advantage here is, number one, that this is the only translation I've seen so far, which gives you a verse-by-verse -verse translation. For example, starting with Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter of seven verses, it begins. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Exactly opposite that Bismillah in Arabic, on the opposite side, you see, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So all praise is due to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds. Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Most gracious, most merciful. Maliki Yawmiddin. The master of the day of judgment. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een. This is thee alone we worship and thee alone we ask for help. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Say, guide us on to the straight path. Sirat al Ladina Namta Alehim. The path of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy favors. Ghayr al Mahdubi Alehim Waladalin. Not of those who earn thine anger, nor of those who go astray. Verse by verse translation. And as we are reading, you can focus your attention more on this translation because as soon as you read Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, at the end of that ayah, that meaning, you see a number. That number tells you that there is a commentary, tafsir at the bottom. This particular one will say 19. You look at number 19 at the bottom in smaller types, gives you the tafsir, commentary. It tells you what is Rahman? It tells you what is Rahim? What is the difference between these two? And what are the relationship between the two? So the, your attention is focused on the ayah longer period of time. So you digest that knowledge. It's more easily digestible. Because the Quran, the whole Quran, is a book of revelation wahi. But Allah bari ta'ala sent this wahi like telegrams. Actually, that's how they came to him, by telegrams. It was not like stories like, you say, you know, once upon a time, the fox and the grapes, or the wolf and the lamb, or once upon a time, there was a, a tailor in China, and he had a son called Aladdin, and no, no, Alibaba, and the 40 thieves. No, nothing like that. The Quran is a very concentrated book. And Allah talks by telegrams. And everybody, it's not very easy for everybody to understand telegrams. We might be literate, we read books and all that, read newspapers, but telegram, to grasp the message of the telegram is harder. And Allah is talking by telegrams. You see, like for example, like for example, our Nabi Karim was engrossed in a discussion, in a dialogue with the Christians of Najran. It was in Medina. The Christians of Najran, outside Medina, they heard, they were Arab Christians, they heard that there is another Arab now in Medina, and he is claiming to be in communion with the Almighty. He is claiming to be a prophet. So said, let's go and cross-examine him. Let's find out what he knows. So they came to Medina, and they, they were housed in the Masjid of the Prophet, Masjid al-Nabawi, very simple structure. Blasted mud on the floor, mud walls, palm leaf, fiber on the roof. Very simple structure. There were no hotels and no motels in those days. So they were housed in the masjid, they slept in the masjid, they ate in the masjid, and they had the dialogue in the masjid. And when Sunday came, our Nabi Karim وسلم, offered the masjid, they said, look, you can offer your prayers here. And he was that tolerant. But during the course of the discussion that was going on, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question, say, all right, now tell us now, among so many other things, oh, Muhammad, now tell us, what is your concept of God? So our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't start like you and I. When we haven't got a ready answer, we say, well, you see, it's like you'll, you'll try me out during question time, and you'll see it. 
You see, well, you know, we are ungodly. Everybody, everybody is fumbling for words, for thoughts, trying to gather my thoughts, and I go around the bush a little bit. Everybody goes around the bush, you know, others going around and around, beating around the bush, till he says, yes, this is the answer. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he doesn't do that. He is waiting for the Almighty. He wants to know, say, look, Ya Bari Ta'ala, what shall I say? He is communing with Allah. Nobody hears him. He is pressing, so to say, his spiritual buttons, trying to contact the head computer. Fi him mahfuz. From the preserved tablet, the knowledge is coming. He is pressing his spiritual buttons. No buttons there. There are no buttons there, but figuratively, figuratively, so to say, he is pressing his spiritual buttons. Siya baritala, what shall I say? Comes the answer. Pull. Wallahu ahad. Say, he is Allah, the one and only. Allahu samad, God the eternal absolute. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakun lahu kufuan ahad. And there's nothing like unto him. Now, once I repeat that, I said, what did I say? Ask people. What did I say? He said, well, you said that there's only one Allah, one God. I said, yeah. What else? Well, he's got no father, no son. I say, what else? Can you see it's difficult? Because it's all concentrated stuff. It is so concentrated. And the message is so... It, it, it's so much per, 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 pervasive. It is. So much is involved in these four short verses. It's like an ocean of theology, the knowledge of God. An ocean. This th four verses. But in its concentrated form, you just read the meaning and you pass over onto something else. You lost everything. You need a commentary and this one gives it to you. Explains to you that what is one and only, when it says he does not be getting, not be cotton, to whom it is being addressed. But coming back to the surah itself, ikhlas, surah ikhlas, which is a surah of purity. We are told, and I believe, that if you read Surah Ikhlas, we say Kulhu Allah, three times, you get the sawab of reading the whole Quran. Have you heard that before? Yes. We say when we start, say Dua Fatiha. So everybody starts with Surah Fatiha, Alhamdulillah. And then we read Surah Kulhu Allah three times, the Surah Ikhlas three times. And we believe that Allah will give us the blessings as if we read the whole Quran. It's a, quite an amazing thing. This Quran and encyclopedia. You read 12 lines, that's 4 times 3. 12 lines, 12 verses, 12 ayahs. And you get the value of the whole Quran in blessings. Doesn't it make you want to think, what is there in it? Just 4 verses, 3 times, 4 threes are 12. And I get the blessings of the whole Quran. Why should it be so? What makes it so valuable, invaluable? It's, it's worth thinking. You see the reason. I mean, I've been thinking. I've been thinking. I haven't had the chance of asking learned men. I'm not a learned man. People, you know, make, out, make me out to be a great scholar and all that. Actually, I'm a furniture salesman. I've been talking, talking, and I talk myself into talking. Therefore, I come and stand here before you. But I have not had the good fortune of going into a university, secular or religious. The only time I go into a university now is go and talk to them. I haven't had the chance of going and getting any benefit from them from beforehand. So, just thinking about it, what makes it so valuable, invaluable? So I find that this surah, these four verses are the touchstone of theology. Means a testing stone of theology. Theology means the knowledge of God. Is a touchstone. If you have this touchstone, you will never go wrong. Any concept of God, any community, any religious group comes along to you and gives you a concept of God. With these four verses as a touchstone, you can either accept or reject. There is no theology on earth that can confound you if you have these four verses in front of you, if you understand its meaning person comes along and he says God is 
two. Like in Zoroastrianism, there is a god of good and there is a god of evil. He says, Ul, tell them, who Allahu Ad, he is the one and only god that there is. He is not two. The Christians say he is in a trinity, three in one. He says, no, Ul, say, he, who Allahu Ahad, he is the one and only. They think there are millions of gods like our Hindu cousins. He says, no, say, he is the one and only god that there is. Negatives, all ideas of a plurality, two, three, or many. Out, out, out. Touchstone. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That he does not beget and is not begotten. The Christians say that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. They say, no, lam yalid wa lam yulad. Negative is the idea. Any theology comes along, this is a touchstone. And they say, God is like this, God is like that, he's so handsome, he's like old Father Christmas, Santa Claus, sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving Father in heaven. So says, Walam yakun lahu kufuan ahad. There's nothing like unto him that can be imagined. So anything you think or imagine is not him. Finish. This is the touchstone. See the touchstone the jeweler uses. You ladies are familiar with jewelers. You go along, let's say your grandmother left some old jewelry, and you take it to be 24 karat gold. And you want to have it remelted and into some modern design. So you go along and say, now what is this worth? My grandma's, you know, take heavy necklace. So the guy, the jeweler, he rubs a part of that jewelry onto his touchstone, his black granite, smooth black granite. He rubs on it, 